speaking and see if there's any declaration of conflict? Yeah, when we get to the financial plan um, and discuss the Burnett to Allen Trail, uh, my family owns property directly on that trail, so I'll step out during that section. That's, that's awesome. very good, thank you. Um, can we have an adoption of the agenda? Okay. Moved and second. Moved and second. Yep. All in favor? Okay. No appointments or delegations today. Okay. Any new business? Nope. Okay. So we're going to get into our business items. Uh, the trail avenue realignment options and there'll be a report from Sanath Bandara. I'll move receipt of the report. Okay. All in favor? Here we go. All in favor of receipt. All in favor of receipt? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The purpose of uh, this uh, the report to obtain approval of the committee to proceed uh, with option one and that both phase one and phase two be tendered together as a single package in 2019 uh, Capital Works program. The background information, I'll just explain about that, the timeline and the background. The district retained ISL engineering in 2017 to complete the detailed design uh, of Trail Avenue from Trader Street to Turnstone Drive. Three concept plans were developed and presented uh, in an open house, one at the Seaside Center in October 2017. ISL presented their summary of finding uh, from the open house to the Public Works, Parks and Environment Committee in December 2017 including the fourth hybrid option. During the discussion, the committee determined the fourth option, is, that is a hybrid option, is the preferred option. ISL Engineering refined the hybrid option, option number four, and, op and was presented to the public at the second open house in March 2018 and was well received. Accordingly, ISL completed the 95% design detail and cost estimate for phase one located between Cowrie Street and Anchor Road. This design includes, included separated multi-use pathway for safety bike uh, cycling and pedestrian use, uptight street realignment and connectivity improvement, smart street lighting, stormwater system, traffic coming throughout at intersections, accessibility friendly intersection after consultation uh, with the accessibility committee representatives. Unfortunately, the cost estimate was getting significant over the budget and council direct, directed the staff to bring another lower cost option based on hybrid option four. After several discussion between ISL engineering and staff and the discussion with transportation choice track, ISL proposed option number two as attached in the package. During that dis discussion with the uh, track, they are not in favor of, of option two. They believe it is unsafe for cyclists putting bikers on traffic lane. Trail Avenue is one of the busiest roads in Seychell. The scope of work has been changed from Cowrie Street to Pebble Crescent in option two. However, beyond Pebble Crescent, the original design option number one continues to Turnstone Drive. Option two includes on-street bike lane between Cowrie Street to Medusa Street, removal of parking lane from uh, Mermaid to Medusa, traffic coming at all intersections, accessibility friendly intersection, this means that all intersections need to be rebuilt. When we compare the scope of work, both option one and option two, 
have had their phase one project length reduced to surf circle from Anchor Road. Phase two would extend the project from surf circle to Turnstone Drive. However, both option one and option two have similar scope of work from Pebble Crescent to surf circle. Option two saves approximately 11% in phase one and approximately 6% over, over phase one and phase two. There may be significant cost savings by increasing the scope of work by merging phase one and phase two and tendering as a one package. The staff have included phase two of the project from surf circle to turnstone drive in the 2019 capital works budget. Funding for this project is to come from DCC, a road DCC, except for a 1% municipal assist factor that's come from uh, reserves. The finance department indicated that they have a sufficient funding to go complete phase one and phase two together if early budget, early approval is granted for phase two in 2019. After careful analysis, the staff would like to recommend option one because the cost saving of option two are not significant. Option two reduces service level and safety in the downtown area relative to option one where this should be highest conflict. This project is expected to have 30, 40, 30 to 40 year lifespan and doesn't require any additional work in the near future. Op option one is to current best engineering practices and meet tech transportation association of Canada guidelines. That is uh, these ones we recently obtained as 2017 tech guidelines. And also, option one will encourage active transportation and create healthy community. So I'm um, sure Pinch uh, from ISL is here to go over the technical details and more additional details. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I am Graham Schultz with ISL Engineering. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me today. And thank you for your summary, Sanath. So I'm going to um, not dive too deeply into the past of the project and how it got today. I'm going to speak uh, largely to the two options that are being presented uh, here. And uh, we have some illustrations for um, So. Keeping in mind the primary goals of the project were to improve uh, uh, safe passage along the corridor of Trail Lab for both uh, pedestrians, uh, uh, multi-users, um, uh, scooters, as well as um, uh, cyclists. Uh, those were the primary motivations. We also had some uh, guidelines to hit with regards to trying to maintain some parking. And uh, with those particular high-level guidelines, we came up with the original plan. If we could um, go back to uh, the first slide uh, up. Yeah, so the original design as we make our way there, uh, as Sanat alluded to, was a bit of a hybrid. It is uh, certainly uh, a very um, welcome standard currently um, where communities are transitioning to um, safe passage. It provides a 1.5 meter wide uh, unidirectional bike lane uh, on either side of the road as well as an adjoining uh, sidewalk. They are prescribed differently. The bike lane would be asphalt in nature and then the sidewalk would be in concrete. What this, uh, in addition to that, we were able to provide parking for uh, on the east side um, of north being uh, to the left on the slide here, uh, all the way from Calgary right up to uh, Pebble Crescent. So parking is maintained on the one side in this, in this particular design. Uh, all of the intersections here are protected um, at no point are cyclists or pedestrians directed onto the roadway uh, except for at the particular crossings. 
that philosophy is actually maintained uh, even in the alternative design, which is on the following page, but just uh, one moment there. Um, again, trying to maintain that, uh, improve the safety at the highest points of conflict, which would be the intersections. So this was the initial submission uh, that we presented based on feedback, and again, we did, uh, we did receive fav favorable feedback from multi-user groups. So without reading uh, all of the verbiage on here, certainly this uh, particular option uh, meets the, uh, is favorable for use for all ages and abilities of cyclists. They are completely separated from the traffic. Um, it, uh, and it certainly would create a consistent and predictable, oh, sorry, back that uh, one sheet there as well. It uh, provides a predictable corridor for the entirety of Trail Ave. As Sanat alluded to, uh, although the image kind of ends here, the prescription uh, generally follows all the way up to Turnstone here. So uh, predictability is a very good thing to have on roadways and streetways and in pedestrian facilities so people understand what is coming up as they kind of roll down the corridor. Um, in the alternative option, again, uh, we were charged with trying to, uh, so next slide please, um, try to utilize as much of the existing infrastructure as we could while still trying to achieve those safety goals. Most of the infrastructure we are looking to utilize was existing curb gutters and, and sidewalks. Given the uh, cross section that we had, which is somewhat varied through the corridor, we were able to look, and beyond um, Pebble Crescent, if you will, there is, as you know, no curb gutter, so there is very little infrastructure to reuse. So from that point on, it is all new. Um, in this case here, um, the primary difference is that, as Sanat alluded to, uh, while we are improving the intersections for pedestrians to be off the roadway, cyclists to be off the roadway fully protected, as we move through the intersection, or the cyclist moves through the intersection, they are then directed back onto the roadway. So we are maintaining the existing sidewalk for pedestrian users, as well as um, motorized users, scooters, that kind of thing, they would be obligated to use the sidewalk. And then cyclists would make their way onto the road. We were able to, given the existing curb gutters and that fixed width, we were able to utilize or maintain parking uh, for the section of road that is between Cowrie and Medusa. Beyond that, the road width does, does not allow the width for on-street um, uh, bikeways as well as parking, so we eliminate the parking. We were forced to eliminate the parking for uh, Mermaid all the way up to Medusa, if you will. As the cyclist approaches the next intersection, then they are directed back into the protected intersection. They make their way through, and then they make their way back onto the roadway, if you will. This alternative, uh, so we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we have two illustrations, and forgive me, it, these are both looking north, not south. So this perspective here, similar, but not exactly the same, uh, gives you, this is uh, Trail Ab at Cowrie, and we are looking north. So the existing um, uh, gas station would be in the upper right corner here. While at this particular intersection, most of the infrastructure is the same, the, the primary difference here is represented in this corner right here. So at this spot here, we have cyclists making their way across across the road, and then they are directed onto the roadway here. That, that, that line there would be the existing curb gutter, and this would be the parking. So at this location, cyclists are directed back onto the road. That is the primary difference of, of all these intersections moving forward. So uh, when we look at uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, um, of, the, of this alternative design, we were not, in its entirety, uh, from Cowrie to Pebble, able to save or retain all that much of the existing uh, roadway, if you will. And I'll ask you that if you could move to the last slide. 
So this slide here, uh, somewhat less clear in the on the overhead, but I'll try to do my best. So this is uh, looking at uh, this is Cowry at Trail, and then we continue north as we go. There's Mermaid, further continuing north to Dolphin. Uh, here's Medusa here. So you can see as we leave uh, Cowry Street the cyclists, and we'll just focus on the cyclists because the pedestrians are always on the sidewalk. So at this point here, the cyclists move on to the roadway. There's an existing curb gutter to the side, and at this particular block, we have parking. As the cyclist moves forward here, they are, are moved on to the protected, um, protected intersection, move their way across, and then they are directed again back on, onto the roadway. As we move forward, up the next two blocks, there is no separation from the cyclist to the traffic. So that in itself is the fundamental difference of the two options. Now in this particular option, it is less friendly for cyclists. They are not protected and um, it is less user friendly for people of lesser abilities or young children, if you will. So they would be less, uh, you know, they are in a safer condition under the original option. So we were able to largely, uh, again, you can see the parking kind of uh, diminishes certainly for those two blocks and, um, and then reestablishes as you get to Medusa. So in our, in our opinion, um, you know, certainly current standards for establishing retrofit or new cycling facilities. Uh, option one is far superior in terms of overall safety. Again, uh, providing predictability is a big thing when you're uh, looking at corridors and option one provides that. Um, whereas option two, the, the prescription is changing as we kind of move north. It'll be uh, in one case you're bound by the barrier curb and you're bound by parking on the other and then it transitions to barrier curb on your side with flow through traffic on your left. And then as you move further north, the prescriptions are the same, you're fully protected off. So you can see the transition there as you move forward. Those are the primary points I wanted to bring up within the two and I'm certainly happy to, uh, if there's anything to add, uh, you know, field questions that we may have. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, is there any questions from council? Thank you. So in the report on page four, it indicates that if we reduce the costs of phase one through the redesign, we would save approximately 11%. But if we do phase one and phase two together, we could potentially save 10 to 15% if we stayed, stayed with option one. Am I reading that correctly? This is a little bit uh, mathematical things. Yes. We we hide the numbers because of uh, it will impact yes. our tendering process. Uh -huh. So if you uh, if we use um, phase one, uh, sorry, option one, uh -huh. and option two, um, the difference is eleven percent only phase one. Yes. If, we, if we combine together phase one and phase two together, then that difference is getting, getting, getting down to 6% of overall cost. And there's another advantage if we put together, there's a high con more quantities, then the unit price going down is yes. overall project saving. Right. And phase one is much safer for the community and we're building for the, the future. Exactly. This is a, I, I don't think that next 30, 40 years we need any any improvement in that section. Right. So we should build, I mean, cause this is my perspective, <laughs> and we'll have to see where council is on this. My perspective is we build it to the highest standard we can at this point, because we're not going to come back and rebuild. So. Councilor McLean. Okay, so question on uh, option two. Um, is there any protection at all for cyclists, or are we talking about a painted line between a traffic lane and the cycling lane? Yeah, thank you for your question. 
there would be no physical barrier between the cyclists. We don't physically have the room between the existing curb gutters to provide a physical barrier in, in most cases there. Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Councillor Lamb, or Acting Mayor Lamb, Chair Lamb. Um, so <laughs> what's the, yeah, well, simmer down. Um, what is the overall cost of this project? So when we're talking about 11% savings, what might that be to staff or? We do have a very rough estimate. It's kind of discussed in, in the budget, which you'll be getting. Okay. Uh, and again, we'll probably find out uh, better quantities and costs as we tender and go forward. But that'll be for discussion as we go through the budget. Okay. Councillor McLean. Yeah, so like Dornelda, I want to speak in favor of option one. Um, I think it's vast, vastly superior in terms of safety for cyclists. Um, I've been working with this project for since the beginning, year and a half. Um, been to all the consultations, and this version one is really improved. Um, it's also a design for Seashelt. I think it takes into consideration that we have a lot of mobility scooters. Under option two, mobility scooters would be pushed into the sidewalk, a one and a half meter wide sidewalk in most places. Um, and that doesn't really give room for two mobility scooters to path, pass each other. So w with option one, the bike lane is beside the, the walking lane and it provides that nice amount of room for scooters. It provides that safe space for young people to ride their bikes. And this is really a key transportation corridor in Seashell. So if we want to take any significant move in towards encouraging cycling, this is the place to do it. Um, a large number of residents could benefit by just this one improvement in the cycling infrastructure in Seashell. So strong support, support of option one. Thank you. Um, any further questions? I just have a, a, a question and we're we're uh, obviously well through the program here with this, but the, um, in, in a lot of my travels, we've had round we 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 deal with roundabouts in different countries, and and I'm just wondering if that was ever considered in like like for the Dolphin and Trail scenario there, where that's a very busy intersection. I believe you're talking about the traffic circle. Yes, uh, we have we have done the concept design in 2014. Um, so we um, unfortunately we don't have enough room to provide the, the full uh, tra traffic circle at the point, unless otherwise we uh, we have to get the cone truncation from a couple of properties. So that's one thing. Other setback is uh, f before we implement this is the first one I think uh, seashell. And uh, the, the cost is only one traffic circle in Gibsons. So this community, we have to give a little bit uh, uh, how to maneuver this, this kind of intersections, give some kind of uh, more consultation. That's great, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Sigurds. So I'll follow that up. So if, if we say we're gonna go ahead with option one as the preferred option, do we still have the capability to go to the community and talk about traffic circles, or is this plan pretty much done the way it is? Uh, I would suggest the plan is largely set. set. Uh, we can always look at components. Um, as, as Sanat alluded to, um, we did look at traffic circles. I think uh, specifically Dolphin was one we looked at. Significant um, challenges with regards to the available right of way. Uh, also, in that particular intersection with uh, large vehicle movements, um, it does not function exceptionally well. And in fact, it would need to be mounted uh, all of the time. And circles are really designed to be mounted on occasion, not by design. Um, so, I would suggest it is 
you know, we, we can always revisit things, but I would suggest it is largely set it. Is there a, a large cost to actually going to a traffic circle versus the four-way stop as we've got it? I mean, other than the other than the having to get additional property. Uh, yeah, and, and there is some cost to that. Uh, certainly, there is cost associated with the lands themselves uh, if you were to go that way. Um, I should also add that traffic circles are are less attractive um, for cycle movement through, uh, and they require in themselves more more room as well. So. Okay. Um, any councillor Toth? Thank you. Um, there's a fair number of utility poles along this corridor. Would the intention be undergrounding of utilities or working around them or what? That's a good question. So we're trying to get uh, underground and uh, it's, it's going about another more million dollars uh, for undergrounding. We had that discussion with the BC Hydro. However, um, there's a one section um, under, under the BC Hydro corridor. So there's some uh, pole interaction with uh, uh, our, our, our line. Uh, our uh, alignment, so that section only we have to do undergrounding because we can't do the high pole because there's a you know, the high tension line going up. Okay, um, one other thing is, um, you know, once again, traffic congestion, would there be sort of a, a time frame? Like, would we be doing this midsummer or would we be doing this midwinter? Uh, if um, the council approved early early approval for budget, uh, we will go into tender uh, February. So first uh, work on, on the downtown area before summertime, and then the summertime we are going up. Uh, so we completed here, then we're going other side, north. Thank you. Mayor Seegers. Thank you. So with regards to undergrounding, we're also putting in new sewer. In as we do this, are we not? New sewer lines going up trail? That's something else I saw in the capital plan. Uh, there's a storm lines, a few storm, storm lines. Storm lines, okay. Yes. Storm lines, so storm lines along here as well. Yes. And so if we, if we were to request that BC Hydro underground, I mean the roads are gonna be ripped up anyway. Is it not cheaper for them to do it then, or would they want us to pay for it, for the undergrounding? They want to, we, we have to pay for that. Okay. Hmm, interesting. Any other questions from council? So we... Um, so I'd like to move recommendations two and three. So that's option one and tender both phase one and phase two at the same time. A second. Uh, yep. All in favor? All in favor? There we go. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nath. Okay. Number two. The most fun guy at the district hall, Mr. Doug Stewart, takes the takes the floor. For me, move to receive the report. All in favor? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, today I'll be. Uh, basically presenting the draft financial plan uh, to the committee. Uh, at this point, the, plan, the goal is really just to give you the information, uh, let you uh, take it, read it over Christmas if you wish. <laughs> uh, then the next step, oh, excuse me, I'll just jump here.
I remember the next slide is, uh, I was just gonna go through the uh, budget process, so, uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, so, I started off with where we are today. Uh, there's been actually a lot of work done up to this point by staff. We started this process in the summertime, uh, asking people to request together, think about their budgets, think about what they need to do for next year. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're presenting the information to you as the committee and to the public. Uh, the next step would be a public meeting. Uh, we're suggesting sometime in mid-January. Uh, I plan to bring a report to the uh, council next week to discuss that. Uh, and then after that, council then uh, gets together in, sorry, I should say in late January would be the early budget request. That's what uh, uh, Mr. Bandera was referring to, where we may bring forward some requests for council to approve a few projects simply to allow them to get started early, get the tendering process going. And then really from February to April is when uh, you as a committee would start to deliberate and discuss uh, all the options and what's been presented to you. Ultimately, prior to May 15th, council must adopt the following bylaws being the uh, five-year financial plan, the tax rate bylaw, the sewer rate bylaw, and the solid waste fee bylaw. Uh, so what I'll be presenting today is uh, what's in the general operating budget, uh, the sewer operating budget, the additional operating requests, the capital budget, the additional capital requests, and what came forward as the community association requests. Uh, what the stars there, what that indicates is uh, these, the th three that are indicated there are what's actually funded in the draft plan. So the additional requests, the community association requests are not funded. So anytime I talk about increases and what have you, it does not include these additional items that uh, basically as uh, staff and senior manager went through the budget, uh, determined that these were less priority than things that were included in the core budget. And certainly on the general operating budget, it's meant to uh, deal with Uh, so the general core operating budget is meant to deal with providing the same level of service as we did in prior years. Uh, so ultimately, the decision for council is going to be is what tax rate would you like to uh, impose on the district next year? And also, there'll be a, probably a discussion around the use of reserves, whether you wish to supplement the budget with reserves, whether you want to re maintain reserves levels or increase them. So that will be part of the discussion as we get through, is particularly on the additional items where there is some funds in reserves that you could utilize. The question would be then how much of them you'd like to utilize. Uh, so looking at the general operating budget, uh, this is just the si uh, highlights of it. Um, the plan that I handed out earlier and will be on the website, uh, we do have all the details in the five-year financial plan that was handed out. This is just a summary of one of those pages that shows uh, on the tax side, uh, basically a million dollar increase requirement for property taxes. Uh, we've got 147,000 more in growth and other revenues up about 50,000, so a $1.2 million increase in revenue. And of course that balances with the operating expenditures up by about 921,000 to maintain our current operations. Uh, in, increase of the transfer to capital, that's that 3% increase that we've talked about. Uh, we're, to, we're increasing the amount funded uh, or amount of current revenue going towards capital expenditures. And also just increasing the transfer to surplus to 150,000. That was a goal set by council a few years ago. We dropped it slightly once uh, a few of the additional items were added last year. So the goal will be to put it back. Uh, ultimately, the goal would be I'd like to see a surplus balance of about 1.2 million, which would represent about 15% of our annual revenue. Uh, right now, we're about $400,000, so we've got a little ways to go to get to there. So that $1 million increase, as you can see, is a 11.81% tax increase, which would equate to $171 for the average home. So I'll go through some of the changes specifically that resulted in this increase. Uh, and just so you know, a 1% tax increase generates about $85,000 in additional taxes. So in this budget to maintain our current services, we're proposing three staff increases. Uh, one is a, in the communications department, administrative assistant. Um, I should say this, the name of this position has changed a number of times uh, from a facility booking clerk to a Philly booking coordinator to a administrative assistant. Ultimately what we're looking for is an additional staff person to take on facility bookings, uh, bringing that service in-house. Uh, right now it's a part-time position that we fund through a contractor. Bring it in-house, add a staff person, uh, so this is the net increased cost, and then also provide some administrative support to the communications division as well. 
The next position is a project engineer. Uh, this was one who would work with developers and engineers to ensure that all of their technical reviews, inspections, and approvals occur in a timely manner. The next one is a building inspector. Uh, this again is to allow us to maintain our current level of service. We have two building inspectors right now and they really do struggle to keep up with the amount of activity going on. So a third one would allow us to maintain that service and maintain that level of service that we've been able to achieve. Some of the other big, big increases are salary and benefits. This is a uh, $330,000. This is the uh, union increase plus a prospective increase for management. Uh, the union one is in the collective agreement, so this increase is for the existing staff. It also does include the annualization of two positions that were added last year, uh, one in parks and one with public works. So that's uh, probably, I'm trying to remember the number now, but $80,000, I believe, is included in that as part of the annualization of those positions. But So the total wage increase in benefits for existing staff, about $330,000. The RCMP contract, uh, this is really just based on what the RCMP, uh, they, they set the rate per member. We have 11 members contracted right now. Uh, the, basically the rate, our cost has gone from $122,000 per member to about $126,000, $126,500 per member. Uh, so basically that's the increase of that. There are some other in, uh, cost increases for the uh, integrated teams I hit and those ones that do come over and support us as well. Uh, the planning consultant, this is an increase in the budget uh, with the uh, number of planning initiatives that we think are going to be coming over the next several years. This would bring the planning consulting budget to $100,000 uh, basically to be allocated on various projects throughout the years, but they would know they had a, a base $100,000 with which to uh, take on various uh, planning initiatives that may be certainly requested by council over the next several years. Uh, the next one is utilities, hydro, and water. This is really just the increased costs of these, um, for providing these utilities based on the three-year averaging that we're seeing. Uh, the next one is a $10,000 increase. Oh, sorry, jumped ahead. Uh, the debt servicing costs. Uh, last year, we acquired an excavator as part of the budget. Uh, it was budgeted to be funded through short-term debt, so that's simply bringing on those debt servicing costs with that excavator. Next one is a website redesign. Uh, this for is allowing for uh, maintenance and improvement to the current website. Uh, the communications manager, I think, would like to uh, look at um, ultimately replacing the entire website. Uh, we thought originally the intention might just be allow us to improve some of the content on the website prior to uh, looking at actually a, a full redesign. Uh, so this would be help us with some minor tweaking and hopefully get the website uh, uh, better information on there uh, from an internal perspective. Uh, the next uh, increase is $10,000 for records management. Uh, this is to look at our archives, our paper archives, and try to find a way to digitize them. Uh, this 10000 would not do the job, but the idea would be to have an annual budget of $10,000 in the records management area to allow them to just deal with uh, issues as they come up, whether it's destruction of old records, uh, digitizing records, but having a base amount that they know they can work with every year. Uh, the next one is a negative, but actually it's good from this number. This is a reduction of tax requirements, so this is a uh, building inspection permit revenue. Uh, just based on the trends, uh, we're anticipating that we can, uh, the budget can be increased by about $70,000 for the building inspection permit revenue. This is offset by a $40,000 reduction in the planning application fee revenue. Uh, it was increased last year, but uh, it really was based on a three-year trend, and 2016 was quite high, but it looks like it's trending down again. So it's really just more of a conservative approach of what we think from the planning applications. Uh, the next one is the transfer of cost to sewer. Uh, so this 65000 is a tax hit, so essentially this is reducing the amount that we're transferring to the sewer fund. Uh, these are administrative costs, uh, uh, human resources, IT, finance, uh, administration costs where we transfer some of those costs to the sewer fund uh, so those users pay the cost or a share of those services. Uh, so uh, we've decreased the allocation from a 15.3% to 11.4%. Again, looking at their prorated share of expenses relative to the general fund, this seemed like an appropriate adjustment. So this is in fact a taking, reducing the amount that the sewer fund is being expected to pay on administration costs. And the next one is the 35,000 is really the uh, 
a, a number of uh, other multi uh, budget changes that were done. Uh, hundreds of accounts that just go up and down based on trends, uh, how much we see we're spending, if we can reduce budgets, some we go up, the net is about an increase of $35,000. So the summary of all those changes is, as you can see, about almost $900,000 increase in expenses. Uh, this would be offset by what we anticipate $147,000 in new tax taxes from growth. Uh, we did get a preliminary assessment from the BC Assessment Authority that indicates that there's about $64 million in increased uh, residential properties uh, in the district, about $200,000 in commercial properties, and uh, the managed forest value went up by about $133,000. So factoring that in using the, the mill rates, we anticipate an increase in taxes of about $147,000. So that offsets the increase for operations, gets us down to about $750,000, or an 8.81% increase for operations and adding in the 3% increase funding for capital is how we get to the million dollar increase or 11.81%. Okay, I'll now jump over to the sewer. Uh, and again, we've seen some changes on sewer. Uh, first thing is a increase of $260,000 in contract services. Uh, this is primarily for uh, the biosolid uh, fee uh, it was actually, I'd say, inadvertently reduced from the budget last year. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm not really know, don't really know why. If, if we knew why, it probably wouldn't have been done. But somehow it got taken out of the budget. Uh, the costs are there, so we are having to add those back in. Uh, there are some other uh, costs included. Where are we here? Uh, there are some other. Uh, contract services being proposed, a $50,000 review of the Water Resource Center operations just to make sure that it uh, is running to its full capacity or full uh, optimization, I guess, and also a $15,000 look at the uh, sewer or computer systems within the plant. Uh, the $65,000, that's the offset to the general fund, so that's the reduction of the sewer of the $65,000, so they're paying administration costs. Again, an increase in hydro and utilities there, $34,000. Uh, this is primarily, uh, we're seeing an increased usage in those. It's not just a, a rate increases. We're seeing increased usage of uh, hydro and uh, natural gas, I believe, at least natural gas of the plant. Uh, salaries and benefits, uh, as we talked, uh, included in there, so I didn't separate it out. There is a 0.25% or 0.25% uh, FTE increase uh, of a staff. Uh, uh, a 0 0.75 FT increase was added for the Dusty Road uh, position last year. We've annualized that to a full uh, FT increase. The estimated wage, at the time we hadn't estimated what the wage was, we actually it was higher than what it ended up being classified as, so it's why we actually saved some money because we overestimated last year what the wage would be, but the net increase is about $20,000. Uh, we are anticipating an additional $88,000 in revenue. Uh, this is revenue primarily from the septic, septage receiving operation. Uh, with the change last year made to the, uh, the bylaw, we're now charging a uh, flat rate across the board for all septage being received, and we are seeing an increase in revenue, so we're anticipating another $88,000 there. Again, another $13,000 increase in other budget changes, that's all the other accounts just up and down. And finally, the sewer revenue from growth. Uh, these are basically new properties that have come on board with the tax side. We also get to uh, uh, add properties to the sewer levy. We anticipated another $97,000 there. So the net increase requirement for sewer to balance the budget would be about $77,000, which is a 3.12% in revenue. That's uh, the parcel tax and the sewer uh, user fee combined. If we were only to look at the sewer user fee, we'd be looking at a 5.7% increase in that fee only. Um, pointing those those out, um, at some point, uh, early, probably in early spring, uh, we'll likely be bringing something to the committee or council to discuss how sewer fees should be allocated between the parcel tax and the uh, sewer levy. So um, it, the rate, the increase will be somewhere between those two. Uh, but overall, it's about a 3.12% 3, 3 overall increase in revenue requirement. So looking at the average home, so the average assessed home right now is about $637,000. Uh, that's based on the average single family dwelling in within the district. Um, I don't know if you can see that too well. So just to show the overall increase uh, at this point, 
uh, we're looking to say that a $191 increase, $20 for sewer, $171 for taxes. The $191 increase works out to about 8.28% overall increase in fees if you're paying all four of those fees. Uh, so the next thing I'll just briefly go through is the additional operating budget request. So everything I've talked about prior to that is what's in that current base budget. These are all th items that are not in the current budget at this point. So uh, adding them would unfortunately increase that uh, tax requirement increase unless you were to remove something else. Uh, so we would like to see possibly a uh, procurement clerk uh, added to the finance department. This would be someone who would uh, focus on procurement help with the uh, uh, writing of tenders, writing of contracts, and managing the contracts. Um, we'd like to see ourselves doing more competitive bids uh, if possible. Uh, it's certainly been a challenge on the coast here to get people to bid on our projects, but we'd like to be a little more aggressive if we can and hopefully get some better competition. Uh, the next few increases are the library. Grants. So this was uh, they'll probably be coming and talking to you at some point uh, about what their increases are. Uh, so there's a number of things they're looking for uh, for their base operating grant. They're looking at, uh, and I should point out this is the district share. Uh, we the district funds about 56 percent of the library operation. So uh, the increase they're asking for, like in this case, the grant increase is about just over $78,500. The district share would be almost $50,000 of that. So that's what the library is proposing at this point. Uh, we are in the middle of negotiations with them for a five-year grant, ultimately for a council to approve, uh, but certainly that's the request they've got now. They did have some one-time uh, requests they've also put forward. Uh, they'd like to do some capital purchases uh, for furniture, computers, copiers, uh, phone system, uh, and website development. Uh, total of about $41,000 to our share of about $26,000 of what they'd be like, looking for. They would like to increase their materials. Uh, in library term, material means all the things that they lend out, so that's the uh, books, magazines, DVDs, etc. Uh, so they feel they are behind in the material uh, that they've got on hand. They would like to see an increase in that budget. Uh, the recruitment, uh, last year they spent a considerable amount recruiting the new librarian, which was unexpected. They used reserve money for that, and they're, what they'd like to do is replenish the reserve that they used last year, so that's the request there. And finally, a library supervisor. Uh, this would be an exempt position that they're looking for to help uh, with the uh, new chief librarian to uh, allow for better management of the library and to free up the chief librarian to do work that she's unable to get to, I understand, just because of the... The, the, the staffing requirements that she's got now. Some other additional requests we've got is uh, to acquire some district branded souvenirs. Uh, ultimately, the thought is that these could be for resale. Um, not sure when that would happen, so this is the cost side of it, about $12,000. Uh, several months ago, uh, the Seashell uh, Heritage Society, I believe it was, uh, said they didn't want to be dealing with the marsh. Uh, and the safety of the Seashell Marsh. Uh, council committed $10,000 in 2018 to do some work there. Uh, Parks Bar would like to have an annual budget of $10,000 to be able to maintain the uh, safety improvements at the marsh. Uh, another two other ones is finally is a contribution to the public art reserve. Uh, this would allow us to uh, uh, build up the art reserve to uh, acquire public art when it becomes available or when the desire is there. Uh, right now there's very little in that reserve. And finally, to uh, do two additional utility box art wraps. Uh, we do partner with BC Hydro to do, or have done for the last several years, two, two I believe, or three uh, wraps a year. Uh, this would be actually have us do two more of our own as well for a cost of $4,000. So that's it for the additional operating request. I'm sort of moving fairly quickly here. Um, so on the capital side, uh, uh, the big thing is the capital budget as a whole. So th this just shows how the capital budget is being funded as a whole. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to point out this is the 2019 budget. So uh, like that MFA financing of $410,000, that's for a uh, fairly significant sewer project that's being proposed. This is actually year one of three. So you'll see multiple years if you look at the 2005 or 
to the, the five-year budget from 2009 to 23. Uh, so certainly in 2019, we're looking at about $16 million budget. Um, I won't get into too many of the details here, uh, other than seeing that uh, a large portion of that is the development cost charges, which is actually is the large piece of it is that Trail Avenue project that was discussed earlier today. Um, so I don't know if I'll go through every one of these projects. Uh, I don't, yeah, want to reemphasize again, the, the, the idea today is to bring these projects forward uh, when we actually get to discussing it with the public and then ultimately with council we will go through each one of these projects and discuss what's in there what's being proposed uh, specifically on there so I think perhaps I'll I'll just jump over these as we go uh, the benefit here if you're this will be online so anyone wanting to look at the this presentation can look at these projects and see what we've got as far as capital projects go So I will jump over to here and look at some of the other projects that um, are not in the capital plan. So these are the, uh, the ones that uh, we, we didn't include uh, primarily because of um, uh, funding issues, really. Again, we, we put in the projects in the plan that we felt had a higher priority and pushed these ones off uh, for council's consideration, but uh, certainly we, we feel are, are less pressing than the ones that we included in the plan. So the first one is a new vehicle for the district hall. Um, so the request is to get a, a hybrid SUV, uh, it's mostly to transport people off the coast uh, for events and meetings. Uh, uh, the thought is I guess we could save some money um, by having the car uh, here as opposed to paying mileage all the time and what have you. So it's this was a... Uh, and the, we do have a current vehicle right now that's used, but um, it apparently has very little value and shouldn't be used too much at this point. Uh, the next one is a boat and moor. Uh, this is a request from the Public Works Department uh, to have a boat uh, basically to allow us to be uh, supporting the fact that we have two wharves and a marina to maintain. Uh, this would uh, allow us to put out the swim floats in the spring, removing them in the fall, and it would also be able to uh, use an oil spill kit when needed in case requirement was there. So, the next one is the Cowrie Street Trees. Uh, this was a, a request for uh, seven new street trees on, on the north side of Cowrie um, and to have, provide electricity to them as well. Next one is Kinnikinnick Park Dugout Improvements. Uh, this is a request for minor softball in the mixed slow pitch leagues. Uh, the project would have us raising the height of the dugouts. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the next one is to uh, exterior painting of the library building. Uh, it hasn't been painted in over 10 years, and uh, the concern that uh, the, you know, eventually uh, the lack of paint will have the building weather faster, so the idea is to protect it. The next one is a fairly significant project. This is to uh, retrofit the HVAC system. Uh, we did have a review done of the system. Uh, it's certainly been a challenge to keep the uh, weather uh, or the temperature consistent on both floors here with the number of exits, entrances, and what have you. Uh, it's a fairly large uh, retrofit of about $100,000. Next one is $10,000 for an access control system. Uh, this would have us using uh, fobs instead of key access. Uh, it's easier than, uh, rather than handing out keys to everyone, hand out fobs that can then be turned off and on and certainly provide better security uh, for the building. The next two are, uh, is the name right? It doesn't say. Uh, these are for the, uh, there you go, rectangular rabbit flashing beacons. Uh, these are the same lights that are on uh, Highway 101 out at Mission Point Park. Uh, so the proposal will be have two here in town, one on Cowrie Street and the other on Norwest Bay Road um, at a cost of $70,000 each. I believe the one on Norwest Bay Road may be shared with uh, uh, one of the developers at the time or done in conjunction with the developer up there if possible. 
Next one there is $500,000 for a Wharf Avenue sidewalk upgrade. Uh, this would be the uh, from Cowrie to Dolphin Street. Uh, it would include redoing the parking and sidewalk along the west side of Wharf Avenue, implementation of a design that will improve the safety and walkability of the area, and uh, beautify the entrance to the seashell downtown. That is a cost of $500,000. On the sewer side, there's a few additional requests uh, they're not included in the base budget at this point. Uh, one is for some additional membrane filters. Uh, some of it is uh, to have them on site and ready to go, uh, have spares. Um, and I believe we are going through the filters a little bit faster than uh, we originally anticipated. Um, the next one is do a sewer relocation from Calgary to Toronto. Uh, this is uh, to re uh, detour. Uh, or to reduce the line from about 400 linear meters to 110 linear meters um, to, uh, to allow shorter connections and less likelihood of problems. Uh, it's also replacing some aging uh, sewer systems along that area. So it's really just improvements to the sewer in that area. Next one is at the uh, septage site on Dusty Road. Uh, this is a spare septage receiver and actually it's combined with the next one, which is a shelter for the septage receiver. Uh, so one is to have a spare for that receiver to make sure when it's down, uh, we could be looking at eight weeks uh, to re replace it. It does bring in significant revenue from the haulers. And the shelter there is actually to prevent freezing of the, uh, what's referred to as the muffin monster now. Um, it's, uh, so I'm not sure why it's called that. Uh, so it's find a shelter of that because there, are, there is risk of it freezing in the winter time. So that's it for the additional capital requests that we've put forward. Uh, the next list here, and I'll, I'll go through them fairly quickly because you'll see it goes on and on. To be honest, uh, we did meet with the uh, each uh, community association uh, in the late fall, uh, get their concerns raised. Uh, so again, we're bringing these to council as a number of uh, uh, issues that they've raised. Some are operating, some are capital. Uh, we didn't prioritize them. They're simply here. We haven't even costed them off yet. Um, my, my proposal would be that sometime early in the new year, uh, I'll be asking the committee to decide which ones they would like us to explore further and which ones, well, that would be it, basically. So as you can see, the S2EBA uh, dealt mostly with uh, uh, lighting electrical on Toredo. Uh, Tillicum Bay, uh, their issues had a lot to do with uh, drainage issues primarily, some pedestrian issues and blind corners. Uh, Selma Park Davis Bay, this was a uh, Wilson Creek and the Park Society were all pulled together. As you can see, there was uh, flooding issues uh, dealing with parking and bridge access across Chapman, Chapman Creek. Uh, we sell, West Seashelt had a significant list of projects or things they'd like us to look at. Uh, a lot of them having to do with uh, road conditions in those areas. Um, I believe the school and traffic and parking problems is their highest concern. Um, but they certainly brought these ones up, uh, issues forward for us to consider. Uh, Sandy Hook, again, they a lot had to do with um, uh, bikes, uh, pathways along there. Uh, the one significant one on there is a second to bottom one where they would like to possibly consider uh, development of a local community center out in that area. They saw it being shared with the other communities out in that area. Uh, there's some more from Sandy Hook. And Tuonic, uh, really they just want uh, no parking sign uh, near the inlet in the ravine. Uh, there's concerns there with the parking uh, in that park or that area is there. Uh, East Porpoise Bay. Uh, again, a lot of their issues had to do with the uh, bike lanes and the, uh, 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 the, the road going through there. Oop, I jumped over one. That's okay. Okay, there we go. Is he more? Pardon me? Oh, there it is. That's where we did jump over one. Uh, Sunshine Heights, that's the area just in West Porpoise Bay. Uh, and they're mostly concerned with, uh, you see that, the, the lights on Gale Avenue and whether they're dealing with the landslides in the area. So I'm not specifically sure what that is. It was listed as something on there, so again. All right. 
So that's it for everything that's being asked for. It's a very extensive list. Um, I did mention at the beginning of the presentation that uh, besides the rate increases that the council will have to consider is the uh, use of reserves and if you want to use them uh, to offset some of these additional items. I, I wouldn't uh, suggest using reserves to uh, offset ongoing uh, operating items. Uh, basically, you can only res use a reserve once, so if it's an ongoing item, you run into trouble. But some of the capital items you might want to consider. Uh, these are the estimated reserve balances based on what's in the budget today. So this doesn't include any of the additional stuff, but if you were to fund everything that's in the, the core budget today, this is what the estimated balances in the reserves would be. So um, those numbers there, that, that's the sum of the general and gas tax together. Uh, what's significant here to think about is uh, what's available to you this year is the lowest amount that's available in the next five years. So basically, put it there, uh, if you were to spend $600,000 in additional money taken out of reserve from the general and gas tax, you'd end up with a balance of about $91,000 in those two reserves. That would, again, translate to an $11,000 balance in 2019 and a $47,000 balance in 2020. So when I'm showing those reserve balances, that's not an accumulation where there's $400,000 at the end of 2019 and then another $400,000 in general capital at the end of 2020. That's the balance each year. So just to, to keep that in mind, if you spend $600,000 in additional capital this year, you're pretty much done until 2021. So just to put it into context for you when you start thinking of these things. Uh, so the other thing, as I pointed out, we did hand out the uh, 2019 to 2023 financial plan. Uh, it's been handed out today. It'll be on the website. Uh, it really provides more details about each of the operating uh, budgets we have. Uh, we we uh, divide the budget into functions and programs, uh, two different ways of looking at the uh, district operations. Uh, I'll explain in the book. Uh, the five-year plan for each function and program for that matter, a five-year capital plan, and the justifications for each capital project. So that's why I didn't go through them here because you, they're, they're all in that book as well. We also included a fair, enough, uh, fair bit of other supplementary information that hopefully helps you understand where we're, where we're at, how we compare to other municipalities, et cetera. So just to recap where we're at today, as I said, we're presenting the budget now. Starting in mid-January is when we'd be looking at uh, going to the public and seeking their input on everything they've heard. Uh, then starting basically in late January or February is when we'd be looking to you to make decisions. So uh, to emphasize, not looking for any decisions today, simply hopefully you can receive the information. And that's really it for today, other than whether you have any questions to clarify anything I've said or want some time to absorb it. Any questions of our corp uh, director of corporate services? Councillor Toth. Thank you. Um, I've got notes through the whole thing, but I'll, I'll ask a couple questions and then I'll see. If, and I'll let somebody else go. Um, the facilities coordinator for sixty-five thousand two hundred and thirty-five dollars. Does that include the savings from no longer paying the contractor? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, in 2005, we had sort of peak building permits. How many building inspectors did we have in 2005? I don't know. Sorry. Like we can certainly find that. We'll take okay. notes. Um, and if we're looking at a decrease in large projects, how come we need to add a development engineer? I don't think he's the project engineer. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mayor. Thank you. So I noticed that we are adding additional costs to the septage. We're hiring another person. We're putting a building up there, et cetera. Um, as I've asked in the past, I'd like to seek a breakout of costs for septage versus what, we, what the costs are for the Water Resource Center. Um, we haven't seen an increase in the septage fees for a long time, and yet we are receiving from all up and down the coast. So 
when we're looking at our, our increase in our sewer rates, I think we need to see that breakout because we need to know that it's actually being uh, collected from the right areas. So will that come forward when that information comes forward in the new year? Yes, we certainly have that ready. Uh, the best time would be to discuss it when sort of we've determined the expenses side of things and we look, start looking at the revenues on sewer. And if you wanted to increase or do something with those fees, that could be offsetting or help you offset the increase in other areas. So we can certainly have that for you in the early spring. Right, but we need the breakdown of expenses by area. Yes, then. we can have that. Okay, thank you. Councilor McLean. So you mentioned that this report would be online. Um, <clears throat> Is it online soon, um, and when can the public ex expect to read this? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow okay. morning. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We actually were still changes up right up until uh, mid-morning today before we started printing it, so it's, it's, a, it's a fluid document. Any more questions? Any questions? A motion to adjourn. Yeah, I'll make that. Yeah, okay. Second. Yeah. Second. All in favor? There we go. Okay, any questions from the audience? Down.